and I made a promise that we are going to bring the F1 to South Africa. What have I done since I made that promise? I have met with the press, the CEO of, of, of F1, Mr. Stefano. I have met with the president of the FIA, which is the world governing body when it comes to motorsport. I've had meetings, I've got endorsements from so we're having meetings, we are moving the needle. And are these vanity projects? Uh, as you say, you listen to what the people are saying, but which people, which South Africans would be able to afford to actually even go uh, to watch Formula One if it is brought to South Africa? You, see, you mustn't just look at how much it costs. You must also think at how much it brings. Let's look at a country like Hungary. Hungary had 350,000 people at the F1. Uh, 250,000 people came from outside. The normal F1, uh, the average F1 supporter or visitor doesn't stay in a two-star hotel. They stay four-star, five-star. They come here for more than five days to the country. I mean, do, do, that's jobs. That's yeah, guys, so following the news that South Africa's Miss Universe contestant wouldn't be contesting for South Africa, and Miss Chidima, who is from Nigeria and had a lot of immigration issues with South Africa, especially contesting for South Africa, now she has actually taken the second runner of position. Getting Mackenzie has actually come under a lot of heat from multiple factions regarding the whole issue with xenophobia and all that. But also in terms of this issue now with his big plans, we know Gideon McKenzie has a lot of big plans for South Africa in sports. His major issue is social cohesion. He really wants to use sport to drive social cohesion, bring the country together, make a South Africans really happy and feel like one fight for unity, fight for equal pay for men and women in sports and all that. He has these big dreams and big plans. One of the major brawls now that is actually dragging him you know into a lot of fire now is this issue with bringing ufc and bringing formula one to south africa and you know like this journalist here asks him which people will be able to afford to attend a formula one event or probably a ufc fight in south africa and how is this going to be increasingly helping to solve the many problem myriad of problems of unemployment of the fact that there are 88 82 murders a day in south africa the water looming water crisis as we see johannesburg breaking down all of the crisis that South Africa is actually embroiled with, you see. So a lot of people have been critiquing his really grand vision for South Africa. And this really comes with a man who is really visionary. You know, those of us who are Christians, you know the, the, the saying that says that without a vision, our people perish. So I think Gideon McKenzie has a really extended, extensive vision for sports in South Africa. But there's a massive backlog of poverty and, you know, that kind of like strain that seems to be slowing him down in a way in trying to implement this thing. But he's really bullheaded. He doesn't care. And I really like the fact that you know he responds to this question about you know would people will be able to afford you know to attend a formula one race or a ufc fight you know with a very interesting and i think i would argue a capitalist move you know in such a way that you don't really necessarily have to ask you know how much you to take to actually have this event but how much will it bring and by the income and the revenue it brings to the nation by the income and the confidence it brings to south africa probably that could be one way in which the society or the economy could be helped but a lot of people also have also critiqued that response and argued that you know his approach to kind of like pursuing these dreams have to be balanced in other words consider those who are the 33 point something percent of south africans who are unemployed and even unemployable and how that would actually have effect what kind of perception these people will have when these grand plans and really these large groups of really wealthy people come to South Africa to watch these games. And so it's really a difficult place for a, for a sports minister with lots of dreams, you know, to achieve. But I really don't think that Getty McKenzie cares about this. I think he's bullheaded. He's, the, he's a man on a mission. He's actually someone who actually cannot be stopped. And he really has a sincere, deep passion for South Africa to see South Africa go. And for me, I'm really passionate about South Africa. I'm not South African, you see, but I'm really passionate about the economy of South Africa. I'm really passionate passionate about the potential of South Africa because I know what, what South Africa can do for Africa. We see that South Africa will be leading the G20 presidency from 2025 with Cyril Ramaphosa. I know there's been a lot of blasting about Cyril Ramaphosa. I will be making a video with Neil DeBeer soon on how he blasts Cyril Ramaphosa and all that. But South Africa has that potential to really represent South Africa and Ni Africa actually in a really interesting light. Same with Nigeria as well. And so when getting McKenzie pushes for these um, you know, visions and strategies, I'm really, in, I'm really you know, invigorating 
liberated and inspired. And so I really want us to really understand how he responds to this question on which people, who are the group of people in South Africa with the high unemployment rate as high as 33%. And I think many of you in the comments have even argued that 33% is not the real figure, that it's likely more because there's so much people who do not have a job in South Africa. And so when the likes of Formula One comes to South Africa, when these big plants like the UFC comes to South Africa, which South Africans will be able to afford to attend these things? It's a really sensitive and interesting issue at the same time. But let's listen to how Getty McKenzie responds to that and share your thoughts in the comments and let's have a really interesting debate on this really important issue. So it's been a bit of a whirlwind, but how would you assess your first um, 100 plus days in office? Out of 10, I'll give myself 12, you know. I'm even, like, I've achieved so many things in those 100 days. And all because I'm surrounded by a very good team in the department. Mm. So, so let's break that down. Giving yourself a 12 out of 10, uh, what would you say you have achieved thus far? All right, let's start with the first thing. Is that when I first became the minister, I was told that the National School of the Arts is closing down. They can't afford teacher salary. They can't afford to pay the electricity. Uh, it's just Armageddon. I, it doesn't even fall directly under me. I didn't even say that. I just went straight and I sorted out the problem. Make sure we put them on the right track. Now the school is operating. 500 kids can still go to school. Uh, I then was told that there's no money to send the youth, Olympi uh, the youth champions to Peru. I immediately jumped into action, called sponsors, got that. Well, I got two gold medals at the same championship in Peru. I have been told that a week before that the basketball under-18 African basketball championship had to be cancelled because nothing has really been organized by the South Africans. I jumped in with my whole team. Voila, we have one of the best uh, under-18 FIBA uh, basketball uh, championships. So I'm saying to you that I've achieved a lot a lot in the thing together with the team that we are leading. And of course, uh, people have lauded you for that. And others, of course, expressing concern that wherever Minister McKenzie goes, he is making promises and commitments. And will he be able to keep to those? Uh, just last week, you promised uh, to campaign for equal pay for men and women across all sporting codes. So what is the plan there? H how are you hoping to achieve that? Let me first start with the first part of your question about the promises. That's what politicians must do. You must tell people what you're going to do for them. So, I mean, you can't just do for people and not tell them, this is what I plan to do for you. Some plans I have, people will say, now that's not important. And then what I do, I then leave those plans. Uh, so, of course, I have to tell people what I'm going to do for them. You know, the thing where men and women in America, for instance, they are getting a right to pay men and women equal. You know, we should leave this thing where we always think that men's sport is the one that you pay people according to the income at the gates, the sponsorship, and all those things. They have nothing to do with gate takings. I think we must try to pay men and women equal. Uh, cricket has done a lot more than any other sport in the department so far. They are not where they should be, but they are strong on their way there. So you say, uh, you know, as a politician, you should be uh, telling people about your plans rather than empty promises. So if we talk, say, football, there's Banyana Banyana who are in action tonight. What is the plan to actually bring a salary parity for men and women in football? You know, let's take something that, you see, football is not totally in my hands, simply because uh, governments should never be seen to be totally interfering in the administration and the running of football. What you can do is, you know, we give SAFA money. We met with SAFA, for instance. We said, listen, we need you to qualify for the African Nations Cup. We need you to qualify for the uh, World Cup. We need you to host the FCON Women's uh, Nations Cup. And if they don't do that, we will stop giving them money. So in that department, what we are doing is we are motivating them to say, you'll lose the grant that we give you if you don't perform that. But let's take something that's in my hands, like the F1. I made a promise that we are going to bring the F1 to South Africa. What have I done since I made that promise? I have met with the press, the CEO of, of, of F1, Mr. Stefano. I have met with the president of the FIA, which is the world governing body when it comes to motorsport. I've had meetings, I've got endorsements from the likes of, continued endorsements from the likes of Lewis Hamilton. We're getting an endorsement very soon from Verstappen. 
So we are having meetings. We are moving the needle. The same goes for uh, UFC that has never been to South Africa. We met with Dana White, the owner of UFC. We met with the management of UFC. They then came back and they said they are coming definitely to Africa. And some journalists asked South or North Africa. He said South Africa first. Now, for me, those are all efforts that I have brought since I came in, and I'm not going to stop. I want South Africa to be on all the world calendars of events. On the 20th of November, we're making a massive announcement, which I can't share now. But South, Africa, South Africans must know they've entrusted me in the sport and arts and culture department, and I want us to, to be the best in the world. You know, you, you can't just be like an obscure country not being part of the world calendar. So if I make a promise, I keep it. And the issue of the VAR that everybody's asking me about every day, uh, you know, they said VAR is expensive. But in my new budget, the new financial year, we're making provision to pay for, for VAR. So people should just give us until March, April, and then we will then give the money for the VAR because mm. we need it. Support. So that suggests that you've crunched the numbers on that. What will it cost to bring VAR to the PSL? And how much are you budgeting as a department for that, Minister? VAR will cost us 70 million rands to bring to the PSL. PSL. It will cost us 70 million rands and it will cost us like 45,000 rands per game. So it's one off 70 million and 45,000 rands per game. We are hoping to budget 50% of that and get the remainder from sponsorship. It's important that you have VAR, you know, you must move with the game, you know, with in the future, and not, not now, but in the future, AI will, will, will overtake VAR, it will, will be part of VAR in saying that they will decide, and not humans, if there was a, a, a fall or if that's a penalty, all those things. And I mean, if we are not even at VAR stage, the, the world is going to move on. So I'm saying that we've budgeted half of that money, 35 million rand for VAR. The rest will get from sponsorship. So by April, May next year, mm. we definitely pass a VAR. So, so what, also... why does the Department of Sport, Art and Culture have to do that? You've got the PSL. Um, one would imagine that uh, they are adequately funded. Um, you know, you've got SAFA who are there, you've got uh, continental bodies as well as uh, global bodies that are involved in football. Why would it then fall on your department to make sure that there's VAR in the PSL? What I've picked up, and this is that there's some sort of reluctance to from some of these uh, officials to install VAR in South Africa uh, for various reasons. But my thing is that we are the Department of Sport, Arts and Culture. We're here for the people. We have to listen to the voice of the people. Currently, the voice of the people is telling us, please intervene. We need VAR. We've been asking for it. It's not coming. Now, when you go to the officials and they say, we just suffer, says we just don't have the money to do that. And South has done a lot of research in that. And then you come and you say, all right, we will meet you halfway. Meet us halfway because we ultimately serve the people and the demands of the people we cannot ignore. Mm -hmm. So VAR is coming. It's not a departmental invention. It is FIFA. FIFA wants VAR, wants the members to, to have VAR. And I'm going to be in good books of FIFA. If, if I'm not going to be seen as interference if I bring VAR. So, and, and I'm asking this because, you know, also in terms of uh, some of the promises, the commitments that you've made uh, since you've taken over this ministry, um, that they, they seem to come like that. Uh, you take the F1 uh, issue, for example. So as you say, and, and I listened to you carefully, you spoke about the continued endorsement by someone like Lewis Hamilton, which, of course, uh, speaks to the fact that this is not the first time that a minister in your portfolio has tried to bring F1 to South Africa. But there again, if you look at the cost, uh, what will it cost South Africa to put on a Formula One event vis-a-vis uh, -vis who stands to benefit from that? You know, who will be involved in that? And if you weigh that up against 
the broader um, needs of South Africans, more broadly speaking. Uh, we just listened to a viewer who said uh, they want to see uh, fields for children to play sport in the Northern Cape, for example. So, again, are these vanity projects? Uh, as you say, you listen to what the people are saying, but which people? Which South Africans would be able to afford to actually even go uh, to watch Formula One if it is brought to South Africa? All right. <clears throat> you see, you mustn't just look at how much it costs. You must also think at how much it brings. People always look at how much something costs. Number one, nobody said that government must pay for F1. That's the first thing. In Rwanda, for instance, they are building a track from scratch, which is government. In South Africa, we have Kalami, which is 80% there, and I'm told that the, the big announcement is being made tomorrow regarding uh, Kalami. Now, already a track would cost you something like uh, close to a billion rand, uh, if not more. And we're not building at this government. And secondly, let's look at a country like Hungary. Hungary had 350,000 people at the F1. Uh, 250,000 people came from outside. The normal F1, uh, the average F1 supporter or visitor doesn't stay in a two-star hotel. They stay four-star, five-star. They come here for more than five days to the country. I mean, do, do, that's jobs, that's tourism. Our country is being showcased. Now, everybody just talk about the price, but what does this, to have 250,000 visitors to your country, to have 70 million people around, uh, 700 million people around the globe watching your country, that's an advert, you know, that's an advert that, that is really uh, something our country needs to have to have uh, the people that will get jobs, the people that will come to this country, the people that will return after the thing, and we're going to get sponsors. South Africa is, is rich in in countries in 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 in, in companies that that the CEOs that there's a love for sport. A love for that. certain sports, I'll say to you, Minister, because going back to the issue we spoke about about um, a pay parity and the sponsorship in that regard. You're not seeing the same level of sponsorship across the board. You will have women's sport that are lagging behind, have been lagging behind, are still suffering, whereas everybody is jumping to support and sponsor the Springboks, uh, to support uh, the cricket team. You know, so those sort of things would suggest that government needs to interfere in a meaningful way that says uh, there, there must be rules in terms of what sponsors can, how much they sponsor, where, uh, on what, so that you can spread that pie more evenly. And, and, and that's what we're not hearing. You know, to say that people sponsor, yes, they sponsor. They sponsor what they want. And this is why the picture remains very uneven, Minister. Do you have any sort of plans to intervene in that way uh, when it comes to the sponsorships? I think we must be totally transparent and honest when it comes to that. No sponsor around the world will sponsor a losing team. People want ROI. People want the return on investment. No sponsor in the, you know, sponsors in South Africa, corporate sponsors has been really really done hard by because some of these federations never they get money they don't uh, account for the money that they got they will send 20 uh, people overseas uh, officials and 18 players these are things that has happened in the past you will have people buying cars with the money that they've been that was used to for at least sponsorship for instance and i'm saying that yes we still have a very long way to go I plan, I've made this one of the big commitments I've made. You know, you look at Banyana Banyana, you know, we already have soccer women millionaires in Banyana Banyana. And I was pleasantly shocked and surprised when I was informed about that. And, 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 and we're not there yet where we should be, but we are not where we used to be. So mm. it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way, that's why I, uh, uh, when they qualified for the Cricket World Cup, I made sure that I don't watch from my house. I go to the stadium and I sit there, I send them messages, all the teams, I send Banyana Banyana messages, they going to go to the UK and play in Coventry City. I send the cricket, uh, spoke to the uh, women's cricket uh, team. What I'm saying is that the fact that it was a subject that's taboo prior to me uh, coming in, now I'm bold in saying that we must treat women in sport better. 
And, and I'm not saying the sponsors and the corporates are all 100%. Um, no, we still have issues there that we need to, to sort out. Okay. And, and I can tell you, all right. we're getting there.